Um, the Creative Commons license is to uh, uh, declare that all the, uh, the, sh the license on this uh, lecture is a Creative Commons share alike, which means that if you uh, use the slides in this talk, which you're allowed to, to use. Remix means that you're allowed to take the one slide you want out of the whole deck, and then you can um, take that and include it in your own presentation. And all you have to do is you have to, two things, you have to say where you got it from, and um, you have to share your slides as well. So, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about databases and visualization tools. And really, uh, databases as really one of the key ingredients of many, if not all, of the, the sort of the bioinformatics activity that we do. We always rely on databases, and uh, we take them from granted often, and uh, we use them, and uh, and so this is, I'm just going to give you a bit of background about, about them. Disclaimer, uh, just to say that I may mention some company names and some products and so forth, and I will not make any profit from any uh, mention of these companies, or I don't have any relationship to any of them. So, not a problem. And my email address, feel free to contact me after the class, my Twitter handle, and if you like to tweet, this is uh, the, ha the, the hashtags for this uh, workshop and for... Uh, the workshop series as a whole. So some of the learning objectives uh, today is to uh, the review of databases and that we use in bioinformatics and we use in cancer genomics. And I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Uh, there are, I'm going to give you some references where you can go find the rest of them. There are many, many. And so uh, there's definitely, uh, but with what I give you today, I think it'll give you a, a good sort of sense of what kind of things to go look for. Then we'll talk about can visualization of cancer genomic data at icgc.org, visualization of data using IGV, the Integrated Genome Viewer, <coughs> and also we'll be doing an introduction to cloud computing, why we're using clouds, and um, <coughs> how to log in to your account, basically, so that you'll be, this is where you'll be doing most of your computes uh, throughout the rest of the week, so that uh, we are um, generously sponsored by um, Amazon Web Services, and uh, so we write an education grant, and they give us uh, dollars for you. So they give us Amazon dollars, not real dollars, <laughs> that that we can uh, share with you. And so that part is um, should be taken into account when you're uh, doing work on Amazon. It's uh, today and this week it will be free, but uh, when you do it on your own, it's not free. So uh, the actual costs. For doing genome assemblies and and are not minimal, but uh, they're they're not extravagant either, and uh, it's a really it's an interesting sort of calculation to see um, do it your own versus setting up your own HPC infrastructure and so forth, and and we can have that discussion a bit later. So and um, so this is going to be really at the beginning sort of uh, introduction to bioinformatics in in into uh, into the, the cancer genomics space. And of course, nothing in, this is a quote, uh, a, a great quote, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And we can sort of say nothing in bioinformatics makes sense except in the light of evolution. I sort of stole it from somebody. And um, so, and really all the inferences we make, all the, our understanding about computational biology, about evolution of tumors, about uh, the function of proteins and so forth comes from our understanding of what gene products do, comes from our understanding of evolution of organisms, evolution of tumors, and so forth. So, um, as a first uh, sort of thinking exercise, um, why, why do we have bioinformatics? Well, we sort of have bioinformatics because we have open data. Really, the fact that we had uh, something like, um, like GenBank allowed the development of tools like BLAST. So how many of you have done BLAST search before? How many of you have never done a BLAST search before? Okay. So BLAST, you should find out this week, uh, is not something we're going to do in this class, but it's something you should go look at. And it is a, basically a search tool to go look for similar sequence to your sequence of interest. So you have your target your interest, sequence of interest, and then you go see, you go quickly look 
across all of GenBank, across all of uh, Uniprod, various databases, which ones is the most similar? And it's sort of, it, it takes shortcut because it's actually a very complicated computer science problem to compare your string of sequence against <coughs> all the known strings. And so it takes a, it, some heuristics where it, it takes some shortcuts, but they're really sort of smart shortcuts that allow for the, the, actually the algorithm to be relatively fast and to find related, very similar and related sequences. And so, but that searching that space became a problem because we had GenBank. GenBank is an open access, open data uh, database resource that we needed to, tools to look into it. If everybody kept their sequences to themselves, it would be very much like uh, looking for sequences in your, you know, you can almost do it by hand by lining things up uh, and so forth. But the fact that we have millions, if not hundreds of millions of sequences uh, makes it uh, really sort of, of challenging. And therefore the requirement to develop uh, tools like, like, uh, like BLAST. So um, I'm, I'm sure you guys think about this all the time, about what the definition of bioinformatics is. I'm actually going to challenge you with that right now. I'm going to ask you to talk to the person sitting next to you and uh, think and pair up with that person and share what you think your definition of uh, one of your yellow stickies, I guess that's what they're for, right, Michelle? The yellow stickies? Yes. The green green or yellow? Yeah. Not the red one. Keep your red ones for later. So the red one is going to be very important when you need help. So think, write down a definition of what you think bioinformatics is. What is your definition of bioinformatics? And don't look at my definition of bioinformatics. It's probably there on the next slide or something. Yeah, it is. That's too easy. Okay, to complicate that problem. I have to shuffle my slides, I think, next time. You have to share with the person next to you. You have to communicate. This is actually a part of the class where you're supposed to talk. <laughs> I'll ask the TA to, to come up with an answer to this. <laughs> their definition of bioinformatics. What is bioinformatics? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, does anybody have an answer? They want to volunteer? Yeah? That's a very good one. I like that one. Yeah. Any, anybody else? Yeah? Yeah. That's a good one. Very good. Do the TAs have one over there? No? You know, I thought you guys, I thought you were raising your hand. Sorry, I don't want to put you in a spot there. <laughs> Anybody else? No? So, uh, where, which Peter? This Peter, OK. Uh, for me, it's like reverse engineering biological systems. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my definition. So bioinformatics is about, and it really captures, I think if you ask a room of 100 people, you get 100 bioinformaticians, you'll get 100 different answers. But bioinformatics is about integrating biological themes together with the help of computer tools and biological databases and getting new knowledge. And it's about a system you can study. So it's really, bioinformatics is really a biologically driven field. So we're, we're all, uh, I have lots of software engineer friends that are in bioinformatics. And, but the, the questions we answer in bioinformatics and in computational biology in general are biological questions. We try to understand we're not trying to, I mean, of course, some of our friends are there to make BLAST go faster. And that's a really, it's an algorithm software engineering problem. But to understand why, what you get out of BLAST, and to understand what it is you get out of the tools you're using in bioinformatics, it's to understand a biological question, to understand evolution, to understand how a particular relationship between the, the, the uh, fun a function, for example, of one protein can be inferred 
to be present in the other protein by their similarity of certain domains and so forth. So it's really all about reverse engineering the cell, but in doing so with biological uh, mindset in, in the first place. Another uh, very important thing about bioinformatics that I touched upon, and it's really sort of core because to the, to the whole field, is that uh, we are totally dependent on other people. We actually, bioinformaticians in general, do not generate data. They use other people's data. And so we're really sort of dependent on an open sort of mentality in an open community. So uh, sort of an open data uh, concept is, is, is sort of central to the way uh, we do our work. Likewise, there is a lot of uh, open source software. So a lot of the software that's used in bioinformatics is open source. And so people will say, ah, oh, well, it's as good as what you pay for it and so forth. And actually, I would argue that in bioinformatics, that's not true in the sense that there's actually some, a number of great software packages which are community-driven, which are, are, are free of charge, but th that are cost a lot in the sense that a lot of people's grants, a lot of people's effort, and so forth, have gone into the development of these packages. And not only that, but uh, it's also often the, the challenge for many of these is, is not to get them started but is to get them maintained and continued and supported as, as so grants are really Genome Canada and CIHR and NIH and all these various f funding agencies are really keen to fund new things there it's a little harder to, to maintain things but that said the, a lot of the community efforts are, are I've maintained many many packages good packages over the years which are, are uh, central to the work we all do. And related to all of that, of course, is that I think the ultimate in openness is, is open access publication in a sense that if you make scientific discoveries that are not in open access publications, then people can't read them. They don't know. It turns your thing, if there's behind a paywall, that means only certain people can look at it. Only Many of us in this room are probably privy to sort of free versions of nature, science, cell, and so forth. But there are a lot of people out there that do not have that and or may have that only when they're within the walls of their university. They don't have it when, when they're somewhere else. And there's lots of stories of people very that from big universities being stuck in hospitals trying to find out what sort of making medical decisions on, on, on paying $35 an article to being able to see, read papers, and so they, they can uh, make the decision. So these three things together, sort of open source software, open data, and open access publication, are really at the core, I think, of, of computational biology and bioinformatics. Not everybody agrees with me. Maybe not even all the instructors in this course agree with me. But I think it's really what is, it sort of sets this field apart in a way that's quite unique. So I'll get off my soapbox now. So, so bioinformatics reagents. So I really think of databases as one of the reagents that we need to use in, in doing the bioinformatics work. So it's, an, it's, it's a sort of way of thinking about it. It's an organized array of information. It's a place where uh, you put things, and if all is good, you can get it back out. There are bad data about databases out there where you put something in it, and then you can't find it anymore. So those are not not good things. And um, so this is a, a, a something that, you know, it's a, sort of a, when you build a database, it's something you test is the ability to, to sort of get it back out. It's, um, it's also, ideally, it's a resource that other databases can build upon. And so a model organism database, for example, is a great resource for, let's say, a human uh, reference gene uh, database that it can sort of infer function from similarity to what's been work that's been done in mouse, let's say, or in, in worms or, or, or some other model organism. Uh, it it's simplifies the, the information that you're working with, so it allows you to, to sort of look at it and make sense out of it all. And, uh, and ideally, it allows you to make discoveries. So if you have a database from which you can actually make discoveries, uh, there are s many scientists that are, that's that's all they do. They just basically make discoveries out of other people's data that they've missed and didn't look at carefully and so forth because it's there because they're using the right tools. And so 
an important thing when you're looking at a, a database is what's the data model? What, how is this data modified? How is this inputted into this? What is the sort of the guiding structure of how the information is organized in a given database? Why does a version number change? What is, if I have two entities that have the same name, is there one called A and the other one called B, or are they both called the same things and you can't make the difference between them both? If I update something, what happens to the accession numbers? What happens to the version number? All these things. If I modify it, I change it, I delete a nucleotide, and so forth. All these things are important things to understand. So a, a, a classic bioinformatics experiment, and, and, and we do experiments in bioinformatics. People don't think about it that way, but it's definitely, that's what it is. You have uh, reagents that you put together. So you have sequences and databases. You do a search, you decide which method you're going to use. You're going to do a protein against nucleotide, nucleotide against protein, or translation of nucleotides, again, the translation of, of nucleotide of the database, and so forth. So whichever one you decide, and so those are the various flavors of BLAST, BLAST uh, P, BLAST X, and so forth. And, and then you get an alignment, so that's an interpretation. You, you sort of have similarity scores, you have, you're, in your, you're, you're testing a hypothesis. So this is really sort of all the, the hallmarks of, of doing an experiment. So you have to know your reagents, you have to know the methods, and you have to uh, do your controls. Um, what kind of control can you do in a BLAST experiment? A classic ex uh, control could be a sequence that you know is in the database. Do you find it if you search with a similar sequence? If you don't find it, that means your, your parameters probably for your BLAST search are wrong. If you can't find something you know is there, is, that's probably uh, an example of a control that, that would uh, sort of, um, you know, change. So, as I mentioned, so we're all sort of bioinformatics citizens here, and what does it mean when, uh, when we, um, we find things? I wrote, uh, several years ago, I wrote a little letter to, in nature, to, to sort of implore to the community uh, that... Uh, when you find a mistake in a database, report that mistake to the database uh, owners or curators. I mean, that's their, if you don't do that, then somebody else is going to find a mistake and they're going to curse the database again. Then somebody else is going to curse the database again and again and again. But there are actually many databases that have curators that work for them. So if you report that error, it'll get fixed. And then uh, it won't happen again. It won't, it'll be solved. The problem will be solved for the next user. And these are public resources that we should, uh, therefore, sh sort of take advantage of and, and, and share uh, alike. So databases sort of, you can sort of think of them as sort of different layers of, of complexity. So you have data. So for example, a GenBank flat file, a cosmic record, cosmic we'll talk about a bit later, interaction record, a protein-protein interaction, um, title of a book, or a book itself. So that's your data in your database. The storage system could be boxes, a sort of simple system. Oracle, which is a commercial relational database system. MySQL is an open source um, uh, relational database system. Could be just a bunch of files or a Unix text file or a bookshelf. All examples of sort of storage systems. So a query system is could be a list you look at. It could be a catalog, and index files. It could be SQL, a structured query language or it could be the grep command in Unix. So those are various ways of, of querying the system that you're looking at. And the information system, which is like the, the big thing that uh, we're looking at, is rel relatively complicated sort of database organized thing. One example would be the Library of Congress, Google, Entree, which is NCBI sort of information system, Ensemble, which is EBI sort of information system, and way of organizing uh, um, uh, genomes, UCSC Genome Browser and ICGC. So you can think about the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which we're going to talk about today, as sort of a, a, a relatively complicated sort of information system that has all sorts of parts that you, you need to understand and sort of follow. So NCBI uh, actually tracks a lot of, and that's been part of their strength, is that they not only track a lot of various types of databases, but they interconnect them quite quite readily. And so, so one of the sort of central piece 
of the NCBI data model is that DNA makes RNA makes proteins, and then you write a paper about it. And so they very tightly link sequences to each other, so protein sequences to, um, to DNA sequences and RNA sequences. They also tightly link protein sequences against similar sequences, so anything that sort of has a similarity score will be uh, what NCBI calls a related sequence. And so if you look at any sequence in NCBI, you can see the related sequences. Those are already pre-blasted, basically, uh, sequences, and so the, for which you know the similarity. And all of these are, are talked about and mentioned in publications. And so they do a very big job of really keeping track of publications and really um, uh, ensuring that the connectivity between sequences and publications. And then that becomes really, as we all know, is basically where all the, the a lot of information about uh, phenotypes, about sort of metadata, about the experiment, about all sorts of other inf types of information related to the things that we, we, we compute on and, and work with are really embedded in publications. So that link to the publication is really important. And so NCBI, so these are numbers from... Uh, 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 2011, and actually, I also have some number from 1999, which is actually the first year I gave uh, we gave this course, and, and the first bioinformatics workshop was in 1999. So it's 15 years ago now. Sort of ages you a little bit. Um, so, and if you look at, let's see, I think yeah, if you look at the next slide, for example, they in this sort of 12-year um, period that's on the slide is is about. 32-fold uh, increase in the nucleotide number of records in, in, in GenBank, 63-fold uh, in the number of protein sequences, 23,000-fold in the number of, of SNP, DB SNP records, and so forth. So all of these various types of databases, some of them you may not know, and uh, I invite you to go look at them and, and sort of see what, you know, the differences, for example, between PubMed and PubMed Central, the different what an OMIM database is. Does everybody know what an OMIM database is? Anybody not know? You don't know? So it's, a, it's the Online Mendelian Inheritance of Man. So it's a John Hopkins database that is now hosted at NCBI, which tries to keep track of all the disease genes in the human genome. So it's actually a, a very, so it's curated by clinicians, and so it's a really good resource if you're trying to understand so many of the cancer genes that we're interested in will be curated as such in OMIM. And so it's a sort of really sort of good sort of standard resource for human disease genes. And so that's just one example, and I and invite you to, to have a, a look. And so to get to get a hold of these numbers, you can actually go to the um, Entrée homepage where you can query all these genes. And instead of typing your favorite gene, you can type in all with filter and square brackets and what it will give you is it will give you the numbers for how many records there are in each of these databases and you can go look at each of these databases we'll see what kind of records they have but it gives you a sort of a landscape of all the things that NCBI has and how many records of each type they have in, 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 uh, in, that, in these databases and they're all retrievable and extractable and so forth there's obviously a lot about a lot of bioinformaticians have made their careers in reformatting things and taking things from one format into another format. That is not uh, the best way to spend your time, but it turns out that it's something that a lot of people do anyways. And so um, I'm not going to encourage you to do that, and it's not that much fun actually, but I'm just letting you know a lot of bioinformaticians have done that in their career. <laughs> and so for example, uh, converting you know GenBank flat files into FASTA file files, and and trying to do the very complicated things of the other way around too, or embedding enough information in a FASTA file that it sort of carries all the the various uh, idiosyncrasies of the GenBank flat files. Um, to this week, though, we're going to talk about FASTQ files, which are basically DNA sequences from sequencing sort of machines, and they are derived from FASTA files, so understanding the sort of the history of the file format sort of helps a little bit. So we're also going to talk about SAM and BAM files, and so those are, are 
alignment files also from sequencing experiments. And then we're going to talk about variation files, which are um, ICGC has a format and VCF is a sort of more standard format. And then there are many, many more. They actually, the URL at the bottom here is it from the UCSC genome uh, group at, that has a list of all the various types and definition of all the various file formats. It's a very useful reference. I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on GenBank flat file because I was actually in charge of GenBank for five years at NCBI, so it's a, it's a file format I know and love. But um, it's not it's not as much use in it, but it does carry basically a lot of our knowledge. So a lot of our knowledge from uh, our understanding of sequences has been captured in, in, in GenBank because people have sequenced, have sequenced their favorite gene, have submitted it to GenBank, have written a paper about it, they've stuck in an accession number that then ref re references this cDNA or this uh, uh, genomic sequence that has information, understanding about the function of the protein encoded by a cDNA, for example. And so there's a lot of that kind of information that's been, is in GenBank that has been, is now being used by RefSeq, which is a derivative of GenBank, which is now used in all the genome browsers and so forth. So all these things are come from basically 20, 30 years of molecular biology and understanding of doing sort of bench experiments and so forth that then end up in, in GenBank flat files, that end up in uh, protein uh, sequence databases and in uh, on browsers and so forth. So GenBank flat files got a header where it's got title, taxonomy, citation. It has features, which is all the, the amino acid sequence often, where there's a gene encoded in that segment of DNA, and the DNA sequence itself. And a FASTA file is actually, it can be either nucleotide or, pro, or a protein, and it's basically a greater than sign, a string of anything, and then a sequence. And then the next FASTA file would be a greater than sign, a string with anything on it. So the requirement for FASTA is quite minimal. NCBI has put a lot, and EBI have put a lot more structure in their FASTA file in the header, in the, this after the greater than sign. They sort of organize it. All their files always have sort of a database name, a pipe sign, an ID, a pipe sign, another database, another ID, and then a short description of what that protein is. So this is a fast day of a protein nucleotide. And I remember when we were at the NCBI, we had a lot of people from computer science and physics and so forth, and we sort of t explained to them the difference between RNA and DNA and protein. They said, well, if it's Less than 85% ACGT is probably a protein. And so <laughs> just <laughs> you give them an algorithm and they sort of they figure it out and they, they were right most of the time. And so um, and so that's you know obviously there's not that much information except the biologist will read that and will see, will read, ah, oh, it's from yeast and it's got it's a protein and it's doing its GCN4, so it's your regulatory protein I know and in the, uh, in the um, uh, control, uh, was it general control of not nucleotides, it's amino acids, uh, amino acids, yeah. And so that's, the, the f but a FASTA file could be as simple as just this. So there are two sort of major categories of databases we think about, sort of primary sort of archival type databases and secondary or curated databases. And some of them, unfortunately, fall on both sides because they're actually uh, both um, archival in nature, but they're also curated. And so GenBank is sort of considered an archival. So GenBank, when I mentioned GenBank, it's actually GenBank, EMBL, DDBJ, which are the three international databases. Unipro, the protein database, is both a primary sequence because it's simply derived from primary data but it's also uh, highly curated. Um, Medline is, is, is PubMed is also um, considered a primary database. Intact is a protein interaction database. EGA and ICGC, there's primary data that's archived there. So, but there's also, like I mentioned, OMIM as a, a database where there's curation takes place. MGDs, uh, anybody know MGD? It's a very 
important model organism database for all of you. Mouse genome database, yes. Um, and, and taxon is a taxonomic database for all, all known organisms for which we have a sequence. So they have a, a, an, an ID. But that's the best way to, to identify an organism is with a taxon ID. Yes? That means usually that there are some curators that work at the database that sort of make sure that it's, it's in better shape than what was submitted to them by wherever they got it from. So that means that usually what we have, we call them bio-curators now, it's a new term in the last few years, and uh, bio-curators have been involved, are, are basically Scientists, they have this, it's a different career path for scientists. So you have PhDs in, that do bio-curation that usually work on a database and, and read the literature, make sure that everything that's in I mentioned earlier, the things in the literature which don't happen, don't show up in the record. But uh, bio-curators will make sure that everything that's in the literature does end up in a record that you can, is organized in a way that it be, makes it retrievable. It's so, often it's metadata about an entity of some kind uh, how, for example, the experiment that was done to derive the knowledge that was that came out, that's done by people reading papers and adding to to a database. So the, a lot of the model organisms have uh, their database, a lot of um, things in RefSeq. So RefSeq is NCBI's version of GenBank, basically, where they take the best, so they, there might be, let's say, 10 records for in GenBank for beta globin, They'll take what they think is the best one. They'll make it a RefSeq record. They'll make it. They'll call it their own, and they'll curate it in a standard way, the same way that they curate all other twenty thousand genes in, in, in humans. So there's, it's uniformly standardized way of curating, and so that people that compute on that will now know how to, you know, how that information was derived. Yeah. So NAR publishes every year. Uh, Sorry, another question? Yes, the, sorry. When you talked about the weights, does that mean that all of them are text-only weights, or not only text? That's a very good question. So, there's actually evidence codes. So, they have, so it could be inferred from like other electronic data, it could be inferred from experiments. So, there's actually evidence codes, and you can go look for the ones which say experimentally derived. That's sort of your bar that you need to believe something. Often they won't have it, but Go, for example, has that evidence code. So everything that's annotated in Go annotation, genealogy, has uh, evidence code. So RefSeq will have many, so RefSeq will have Go terms attached to it, and these Go terms will have uh, evidence code attached to it. My question is that RefSeq means that every every gene that has been created or compiled is evidence included, or no? No. So, so, so there's different. So, RefSeq. So if there's a if there's a transcript, if there's a message RNA, that means somebody did an experiment and sequence. So there are no synthetic sequences in RefSeq. So every sequence is derived from some organism, and every transcript is derived from a tissue from some organism. So what uh, RefSeq, uh, if there's a tissue that or where it came from, so it knows it's from an organism, but it could come from a certain tissue, a certain developmental stage. That information probably does come from a paper and will have been curated by somebody. A message RNA by itself is an experimental result, but it's telling you that a transcript was found that looks like this, that is a beta globin transcript. So that, that's an experimental result. But the fact that it's from that tissue or that developmental stage, that usually comes from reading the paper or from the submitter that did the experiment. Just check. Okay. So, um, so NAR has uh, once a year has a database issue in January that has about, I think so far they have something on the order of about 1,500 databases. And every year, uh, some of the top tier databases, i.e., things that come from uh, NCBI or EBI or the JTI, also. 
the West Coast, the DOE funded labs, those get mentioned in these databases. And so their databases get, they can, they're allowed to sort of write an update every year. But most databases only are allowed to do an update every two years. And so, and then some never, if they don't do any, they have to justify uh, being uh, in, included in the NAR database issue. So it's sort of become the standard to be, to be a top-notch database is to be included in the NAR database issue. And so uh, here I point to you to two years worth of, of database issues. So if you want to have a look at all the new databases uh, that are still sort of alive and well, you basically have to look at it a couple years worth. And um, this is an example of NCBI. So NCBI does one, they'll have a paper on GenBank, but they also have a paper on all the other databases that they put into one paper. And that's an example of, of such, uh, of such uh, uh, a paper, which is in Nucleic Acid Research, which is an open access journal, free to download, but that goes without saying. Um, so what is GenBank? So GenBank is the NIH genetic sequence database of all publicly available DNA sequences. And actually, uh, when the first draft of the human genome was done, that was put into GenBank. And, uh, uh, and many other, uh, other uh, Jim Watson's DNA is in GenBank, uh, Craig Venter's DNA is in GenBank. So it is the sort of the public repository of open access uh, sequences. So I mentioned DDBJ uh, ENA, which is European Nucleotide Archive, and GenBank. So those are three. They're, they're actually the same database. Everything that's in GenBank is in the ENA, or used to be called EMBL, and everything that's EMBL is also in DDBJ, because these databases exchange every day what is submitted to one then it ends up in the all other in all three databases on a daily. If you submit to EBI, it ends up in EBI, but it ends up in GenBank. But if you want to do an update, then EBI has to do the update. So wherever you submit to in the first place, that's where the submission, the updates, and so forth are, are are done. But each database has their way of querying and 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 and, and looking into things and um, doing searching and blast and fast day searches and so forth. This is a, a figure from uh, uh, Rolf Poiler in, in the textbook we wrote. That's correct. So it's actually the advantage is probably to do it in the one you think is closest. So from a submissions point of view, it's probably easier to submit in your time zone because you actually probably need to communicate with them and so you don't have to do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. So if you're in North America, submitting to NCBI makes more sense. From a, a user's perspective, I think it's from whatever services you like to use and whatever you think is connected. If you like Ensemble a lot, then you go with the EBI. If you like all the other NCBI products, then you go to NCBI. So it's really from, but from a data point of view, in terms of downloading the database, they are the same in all three, except the format. So we. A lot of equal years spent parsing EMBO format into GenBank format. It's a waste of good people time. So Havana, that's a whole different, so that's another level of curation. That's another level of, uh, of added value, which is unique to one product, which is the GenBank. So not the Havana gene products don't usually make it into I don't think they make it into the GFT browser, and I don't think they make it into the NCBI, any of the NCBI browsers. So that's specific to uh, EBI and EBI products. And actually, one of the things that I'm not going to talk too much about that, I'll just quickly mention. So the difference, one of the difference between UCSC, EBI, Ensemble, and NCBI's browser is that at the framework, the sequence coordinate system, it's all the same. They all agree on one coordinate system. But it's how each then decorates or annotates the, the, the genome. That's where the difference is. And some are more liberal, let's say, and some are more conservative. So NCBI is more conservative. They, they are 
less likely to, to put in a, a, a gene model unless there's some good evidence for it. And EBI will sort of have more sort of potential sort of gene, you know, gene models that could have been only sort of derived from some uh, gene prediction software. They'll have special codes for it, so you know it's a, it's a gene model that doesn't have as much evidence behind it, but it, they'll, they'll be included, and so they may lead you down the false track or may give you some insight that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So it, it's, it, it could be taken both ways. So, um, so there's lots of different kinds of files in GenBanks. There are sort of the gene, the one I mentioned earlier, the one gene investigator. So their favorite gene, they've spent their whole career working on this gene. They've submitted the sequence to GenBank, and it's, it's well annotated. It's lots of knowledge, lots of validation, biochemistry, active sites of the enzyme, it's all that kind of stuff. And that's, those are the, the gems, I guess, in, in, in GenBank. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff in GenBank, especially today, that came from, uh, you know, large genome centers that just sequenced the whole genome, did an assembly and predicted where the genes were and did some modeling and so forth and, and put it all together. And the, the modeling came from EST, where, again, EST express sequence tags are, are transcripts, which are short and not full length, which give you sort of models of, of where genes could be and so forth. So all these things are, have to be taken with a, with a grain of salt. And there's a lot of things which are unfinished. So they, they, they'll do a, a 2x or 3x coverage of a genome, and they'll try to assemble parts of the pieces, and they'll submit it to GenBank, and that'll be all you'll ever see from that organism. And so you have to, it won't, you won't see that for humans. So human, we have, we're, we're lucky to work with the human genome in, in cancer genomics because we're, it's a very much better understood genome because of all the efforts and so forth that have been sort of applied to it. But it's, a, it's been a very, um, uh, there's a whole range. You have to keep in mind there's a whole range of things. In, in GenBank, there are files are, are, divi are put into these divisions, and it's really historically, that was sort of a file size limitation problem so that they could deal with, they couldn't deal with large files and, and on vaxes and things like that. And so now it doesn't make sense to have file size limitation, but they've sort of still, they've kept those, those file size limitation. But I really, I, I think of GenBank in sort of two categories of divisions. There are some which are functional, which are actually very useful to understand and very useful to use and, 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 and maximize on. And then the organismal one, which don't really make much sense because actually there's a, there's a lot of differences between ENA and DDBJ and, and GenBank with what they put in those, those divisions. And so it's not really well done. And really for organisms, if you want to separate organisms, you should use taxon IDs. You should not use GenBank divisions. But to understand what, um, let's say, an EST, an express sequence tag, which is a short read from a cDNA, and to work with and do use tools which are specific for ESTs, that makes sense. So to extract you know, to the human ESTs and to assemble them into gene models and so forth is a useful way of dealing with, with uh, that, that sort of that, um, division. So in GenBank, things are put together for various reasons, and understanding why is, is, this is so is really useful to take advantage of this database. So another big thing is identifiers. So if I look at um, this list here, so this first locus, so a GenBank record starts with a locus name. The locus name is probably historically, the rule is a locus name has to be unique in the database. The rule is not that the locus name has to be the same in between databases. And historically, locus name was something that people memorized, like SV40. So the, the first time people sequence SV40, the locus name for that one was SV40, your favorite gene, Globin, as uh, Globin, uh, it's, it's a derivative of the word Globin. And so you would memorize, although I haven't. Um, but now we have millions, we have hundreds of millions of records. So nobody memorizes. This is in the old days when, uh, when there's only like 100,000 records in GenBank. You know, I can memorize a few of them. But now there are hundreds of millions. And so it doesn't make sense to memorize anything. 
And so locust name is awful because it's actually not maintained between the databases and it's, it's, it's not very useful. The locust, uh, sorry, uh, the locust, yes. So the accession number, so now that is an, a useful one, that is an important one, and that's the one that's referenced in the publication. And so I will sequence a gene and I will reference the accession number. And um, what's happened since then is that we actually now have a version of an accession number. So a version means that the for GenBank, if there's if a version goes from U12345.1 to U12345.2, that means the sequence change. It could have changed by one nucleotide, or it could have changed by 10 megabases. It's still the same record changed by sequence, and so it gets an increment of a version number. If you annotate or change the features or anything like that on a, on a GenBank record, that does not change the version number. The only way a version number or an accession number changes is when the sequence changes. Okay, so that's a good understanding, important thing to, to understand. But if you have a protein, yes? Why would that happen? Why would that happen? So, so one reason, I, I, I found a record once that had a um, uh, contaminated They resequenced it and they found one letter was in the wrong place and they needed to correct it. So they, they, that's how, that's why the sequence would change. The most, that's the most common examples of, of why a sequence would change. But let's say they, they are doing bacterial sequencing and they sequence two genes in the chunk of the genomic DNA. And then later on, they discovered there's a third gene in the middle that they hadn't annotated. They'll go back. They'll put the annotations to show that there's a third CDS coding sequence in the middle between the other two that were missing. So they didn't change the DNA sequence, and therefore the version number of their DNA sequence doesn't change. But the amino acid sequences, they have a version number. And so the first one and the second one are the same, but now there's a new one in the middle that didn't exist before that now is associated with this DNA sequence. As I mentioned, NCBI keeps track of all the relationship between the proteins and the DNA, that's an example where it would keep track of that. But, so, so it's not, but it, let's say it was actually two transcripts, but it's actually, it's an open reading frame that is actually interrupted by whatever reason, by a sequencing error, it's actually one open reading frame. So you had two accession numbers, but now you only have one, that became 0.2, and then the other one got removed. And so that's how that would, have, so there are all these kinds of corrections. And people find similarities with other organisms, and they say, oh, well, in this organism, that's one open reading frame. Why is it two open reading frames? And that one, was it a sequencing error? They go back and, and resequence it or, or check it, and it is indeed a sequencing error. So historically, before GenBank had uh, accession numbers, it had GI numbers, which stands for GenInfo. And it's basically, the G, a GI number is the same logic as a accession dot version, except that uh, it's just an integer. So if the integer changes, um, then that means the sequence changed. Yes. So is subnet information stored then at uh, any public? No. So all of, so no. So that's a good question. So <coughs> lots of people have submitted sequences to GenBank, which are never got published. So there's a reference block on every GenBank record. But it could the, the, the default reference block is, says it was submitted by such and such, and so it tells you who it came from, but not necessarily a publication. So it will have a, if there's a publication, there will be a second one, which will have a full a citation part of the record. Yeah. Let's see what time? Okay. So uh, protein have GIs as well, and protein have IDs as well, which also have version numbers. So it, 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 it all works the same way. So if you go to NCBI and you look, you can actually look at the um, revision history and you can put in, let's say, the top two uh, records there have the
the same version number, which means the sequence didn't change between them. Uh, sorry, they have two different GIs, which means they do have they do have uh, the sequence change. And if you look at the diff, this is like a diff between those two files, and it shows you the date change, but the number of nucleotides has changed also. It used to be uh, 106,330, and it got 106,210. So it lost 120 nucleotides. And so the, because of that, then the GI number changed. So the accession number space, so accession numbers are usually one letter plus five numbers, or then we ran out of space, so we ran out of letters and numbers. So we started using two plus six, then we were running out of those. And then the whole genome sequencing, which are not distributed with GenBank, but there are four plus two plus six. So it's four letters plus two numbers plus six numbers. So the, it's a root, two numbers. And then proteins are either one plus five or three plus five. So if I look at any accession numbers, I actually know if it, came from, if it belongs to a protein or a DNA, because they all have different structures. And they all now, it didn't, historically they didn't, but now every record in GenBank and every protein in GenBank has got an accession dot version number. So what about human stuff? So there's the Genome Reference Consortium, which is historically basically tracks. Now it's a, it's a collaborative multi-institute uh, group that sort of has agrees on a set of coordinate system that everybody uses for hanging their, their annotations on. What annotations they add, like at the EBI versus NCBI versus USCSC or versus anybody else, will differ, but they all agree on, uh, on the human genome uh, reference um, coordinates. So for humans, we're now at GRCH38, so version 38. And what you'll find is that many browsers and many groups won't be at 38. They'll still be on 37. Because to go from 37 to 38, it takes years sometimes. And it takes, you have to recompute everything. You have to realign and so forth. It's quite complicated. So um, I think on the next slide, yeah. So on the next slide, so 38 came into power on December 2013, so just last December. It had been almost basically five years since the last update. So between uh, 38, 37 and 38, and only three years since. So the, the updates are coming slower and slower now because they're, first of all, they're, we're getting closer and closer to being finished. We're actually not finished the human genome. I was surprised. I know it's a shock to all of you, but we're not done. There are still gaps. There are still things which are unclear, but it's 30, you know, 3 billion bases that we have to organize and so forth. But... Um, it will be a few years, for example, in the ICGC, people were just asking me recently, are well, you guys using GRCH38 yet? I said, no, we're going to, because we want to, we have to impose it across the board to all the country, participating countries, and it's going to take them a long time to rejig their pipelines and so forth to be able to work with GRCH38. And so, one interesting thing that happened with this last release is that uh, UCSC, which had the increment, you know, went from HG1, HG2, HG3, HG19. So now it went from HG19 to HG38, so that HG38 would match GRCH38. GRCH38 was only there for three releases. Before that, it was NCBI 36.135. So, it was, you know, NCBI Bill 36 <laughs> became GRCH37. So that, that one is basically, it wasn't NCBI anymore. It was a group of people that sort of agreed on this coordinate system. But it actually goes back to 2002 or 2001 when uh, UCSC uh, switched from HG8 to HG10 where they agreed to, everybody agreed to take NCBI's build. So they agreed, they, they each doing, so you can imagine before 2001, everybody was doing their own build. Everybody had their own coordinate system. And everybody's trying to compare their gene with the other people's gene, and that was in, sort of impossible. They finally, it wasn't necessarily the perfect solution, but it was the same solution for everybody, which allowed it now to compare models from one, organ, one 
browser to another browser to another system. That was a really, so right now, most of the things we work with are still in HG19. Some of the things that uh, we may do this week, maybe with HG18, uh, and keeping track of that will be very important. Uh, another concept is, is bioprojects, which is basically a, um, it's an NCDI-led initiative, but EBI is, is on board also. It's keeping track of larger things when you have, yes? The question I'm going to leave is that you, yep. that you said that this would possibly, the new version could possibly come, or it will end Well, up yeah, years? except now the last one took six, five, six years to come, uh, almost five years. The other one before that took, it was on for three years. The thing is, it's not finished yet. There are still the ones that's finished. Which will then we be the new version. Uh, corrections. Corrections. So the problem is, uh, well, one there are many problems. But one problem is, is that it's a reference. This is considered the reference, and the problem is there is no single reference, right? Especially if you start thinking, you know, what's the the Japanese reference versus the African reference versus the Russian reference? You know, those don't don't they're mo they're different references. And and in cancer biology, we do we measure mutations in our in a, in the cancer genome compared to the normal genome. So we use actually the other, one. but the assembly of the normal genome is actually made against a reference. And the mutations in the cancer genome is also made against a reference. And so we're comparing against this reference, which is a bad reference to start with, and then we're making some inferences. So references may, and all of that we're using right now because we don't have any really good de novo assembly program. So we don't have any good way of taking a raw sequence reads, assembling it into a, a finished genome without actually using a reference. We need a reference right now because that's the best solution. But it, technically, it's not the ideal solution. The ideal solution would be to do a de novo assembly. And so once we have that worked out, once France and Jared's group and so forth sort of figure that out, then we won't have, that won't be a problem anymore. So we will forget references. We'll just do de novo assembly. We'll just figure out the right, the true reference for the cancer genome will be the normal gene. And that will be a simple solution. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle's telling me to hurry up. So, biosamples are quickly. Um, so, all of this is to make discoveries uh, in cancer biology with respect to uh, uh, all the various data types we, we, we have access to. So, we have uh, muta simple somatic mutations, we have methylation. Uh, marks, we have um, gene expression alterations, and we have a lot of structural variations, uh, small in in insertion and deletions, and so forth. So we have a whole slew of things that we're trying to figure out so that we can understand what is happening in the cancer genome. So things in the cancer genome space have changed quite a lot in the last few years. Initially, we got our understanding from looking at, at short sequence tags, which gave us an idea where the genes were and what the genes were and where they were. Uh, then we used those to map and to also assemble the, the, the genome, for which we didn't have a sequence yet. This is before the human genome was sequenced. We got lots of in, insight into polymorphisms, how a, the worldwide change, uh, changes exist uh, with respect to uh, population migrations and so forth. Uh, and, and involved in genome-wide association studies, which was also linked in many cases to diseases, which allowed us to discover uh, disease-associated genes. Then there's the infamous Homer paper, which is a paper that sort of demonstrated that with a when you did a, a case study of, let's say, comparing a normal group versus a schizophrenic group and looking for variants in each of these groups, if I only had a few variants from you, and I knew you were a part of that study, I could quite, with a good probability, highlight which of the two groups you were associated with. And so all that data was open, and the home, after the Homer paper, NIH shut 
the sort of WGS data down and made it controlled access data. And basically, the whole concept of identifiability of, uh, of individuals belonging to a certain group uh, became a very sort of critical ethical issue that have encumbered the openness of, of, of data with the caveat that it's important for this data to be encumbered and to be controlled access and so that only people that sort of sign off saying I'm gonna I'm not gonna do anything bad with this data and I'm not gonna do uh, I'm not gonna try to re-identify this individual and I'm only trying to do this so I can you know get a better understanding on this disease or, or what have you so this kind of stuff is really important and we will uh, sort of um, but all of that happened with the Homer paper in about uh, 2007, 2008. After that, there was a Cancer Genome Atlas pilot project, the Thousand Genome Project, uh, which is actually an open project, which is, and that, there was some problem with that too. The Cancer Genome Atlas full project and the ICGC. So the ICGC is, uh, includes and in, it, it also has, so the Cancer Genome Atlas is the American part of this international uh, large scale project. And that really, the, the ICGC and some of the work done at Hopkins and so forth is really what led to, to our, this ICGC database. Basically, it was the identification, so the analysis looking at, at exomes of many tumors and looking at the variation that exists and the similarities in some of these samples is what led us to the understanding that we, want, we need to do a lot of these and we need to do it large scale if we're going to get any insight as to what's being sort of uh, hidden in, 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 these, in these things. And so both of these, uh, the Hopkins Initiative, the Wellcome Trust work, and the TCGA sort of pilot project were really at the foundation of the ICGC. So the people that worked on that were also a, sort of the founding meeting that led to the ICGC. And the lessons learned from that work was that there's a lot of heterogeneity across tumor types. There's a high rate of abnormalities and, and drivers versus passenger mutations, and then the sample quality matters, i.e. The, how you treat your tumor, how you harvest it, how you store it, how you uh, process it, and so forth, was really key. And those are some of the things that when we started the ICGC, we, were, we really took uh, care in, in using that information. The ICGC had basically one goal, is to basically sequence uh, tumor normal pairs from 500 individuals for 50 different tumor types and to after and for each of these to look at the genome, the transcriptome, the methylome and the clinical data and to actually follow the clinical data over time so that we would have then could use the genomic information as a, uh, as a uh, to use be able to, to predict uh, outcomes on, of the disease and basically uh, to make and to make this data uh, available to the research community and to the public, and so the um, this ICD is a humongous project, and so it could not be done by any one country, and so it uh, really took the establishment of standardization of of, of quality measures and um, the merging of data sets and to increase the power and to have multiple uh, data sets from all over the world what made it possible and um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to basically keep track and have information about the projects about the patients about the tumor about the samples and how they were collected about how they are extracted and how they were manipulated about the sequences about the analysis of these sequences and about the interpretation and so there was all such things that basically we we're trying to capture in the ICGC initiative so this is an update of the figure that uh, Andrew showed you earlier. So we actually have, as of May 2014, we have 71 projects. We have about 18 jurisdictions because we have, why we call them jurisdictions as opposed to countries, we have some of them are like EU and some of them are France and UK working together and so forth. So we have 18 teams of, or countries mostly. We have 42 cancer types of the 50 that I mentioned that have, for which we've received uh, sequences so far. And we have over 10,000 cancer genomes for which we have some information. We have promised in the order of 28,000. So we have basically all the samples are all queued up 
for the completion of the project. So we're we we're supposed to have 25, or we're going to have something like 30,000 uh, genomes at the end, which means uh, more than 60,000 uh, genome uh, because they're all tumor normal pairs, right? So it's uh, it's it's a lot of genomes uh, to to be able to hand to to handle. The OICR is actually the headquarters, the DCC, the Data Coordinating Center for the ICGC. So this is our growth curve of our tumors from, from which we've been receiving data over the last few years. And so it's standard growth curve. It's, it's, it's happening all the time. The ICGC.org is the portal for, for this all this data and all the information about this data. Uh, if, you, um, if you go click on any one of the projects you can uh, see some details and you can go further back into in the projects and, and see how how they what information they have on the top bar is you have clicks for the data portal the DACO which is the data access co uh, coordinating office information and login and so so one of the big things um, we, we have is that we have now two data sets. We have the open data that we can make freely open and because it's not identifiable, so it will not be, it cannot be used to identify an individual. And then we have the controlled access data, which is by itself identifiable. Uh, some surgical uh, details, some clinical details are, are considered controlled access, but the most, the biggest piece of the controlled access data would be raw uh, level DNA sequences at the transcriptome or at the uh, genomic level. And so a genome file, a BAM file, an alignment file, all of these files are considered controlled access and, and therefore cannot be released freely available to the public. What uh, we have on the, on the DCC portal, if you go there now, you don't have to log in or anything like that you'll have access to all the open data. So all the open data means you don't have to log in. And so we have at the top bar, we have three um, categories. So we have the, um, uh, the cancer projects. So I mentioned there are 71 cancer projects. The advanced search where you can do what we call faceted searches. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. And the data repository. So this is if you go to the cancer project page. So it has a. If you go to that page right now, if you want, uh, on your computer, you can sort of click a little bit. Not necessarily as much detail as you would need to, but so for example, if you go to dcc.icgc.org, you'll have this pie chart that if you mouse over, will show you all the various parts of of the. So within a, a pie slice will be all the tumors from a tumor type. And then when the pie slice is sort of split up on the outer circle, that's all the different projects which have the similar sort of body part but from coming from different groups. And it gives you a, an idea of the numbers for that. If you go to the, uh, and that's the same pie chart that's on the projects page and because that's the overall. But on the, on the left-hand side, you have, um, if you go to the advanced search, on the left-hand side, actually I have it both on the left and on the right hand on this image, uh, you have what we call faceted searches. So you have the ability to go look and select which parts of the, which tumor types you want, which stage of uh, the disease you want, which uh, you only want, which gender, which, so you can sort of select and it, as you click, it selects that and it updates the pie chart. It updates everything. It's all very dynamic and very fast uh, uh, searching, uh, searching at, that's made possible through this um, very uh, well-engineered uh, backend to this database. And so if we go to, so all the advanced search all have a, um, a download uh, the data so you can go select which data sets for a given donor or group of donor you want to download and that uh, is then you can have that on your desktop to, to go do your further searches. If you go to the repository you can also go to any specific project and actually download all the files from that project. For example, the example I have here is 
all the somatic mutations from pancreatic cancer that's done in Canada, which is actually done at OICR. So OICR is doing a pancreatic cancer project, and they've generated some somatic mutation data, which is available in the repository. So all this data is open access because somatic mutations are not identifiable. They're not germline variants. Okay? Yes? It's very similar. Yes, yes. It's very similar. Yeah. So except one thing I, I'll have in a slide. Maybe I won't have time before lunch. Well, maybe. Um, I have a slide later that uh, they don't trust their somatic mutation callers. So TCGA doesn't. We do, but they don't. So the reason is, so why should I not trust a somatic call variant caller? So, so what happens if there's a mutation that falls on a on a SNP on a variant that is identifiable? So let's say position two million three hundred and thirty-three. That's a very it's a rare SNP. So very few people have that that SNP. And if you have ten of those rare SNPs, I know who you are. But if you happen to have a mutation at that position, and you declare so a mutation, a somatic mutation, that ha so to know that it's a somatic mutation, I have to know what's on it norm on the normal allele. So if you declare the normal allele, and you declare the the SNP and the, the somatic mutation, then I know that and I know that that position is where a variant exists. If I know that coordinate system, then I'm able to. Uh, maybe identify the individual. So when we discovered that a few months ago, we actually decided to filter out all the mutations that land on known SNPs. So at ICGC, we make a separate file that's only available through controlled access file, which is a somatic mutation file, but only that lands at position where there's a variant. So it's rare. I mean, it's it's a few hundred, a few thousand per individual. If you have a million mutations, there might be a hundred of those SNPs that fall where there is a known SNP, and it becomes identifiable if you declare what the normal variant is for that position. So what we do now is we we actually lie. We don't tell you what the normal variant is. We tell you what the the reference variant is. So you may have a different variant at that position, but that's sort of a half lie, but it is a lie. But what we do is we document it and we let you know. And then if you get controlled access permission, then you can go see the real data. It's No, it's a, it's a germline variant. That's why we're hiding it. Yeah. So a lot of clinical data, like, gender, uh, age of diagnosis, uh, which is for old people is actually a, a period. It's not an actual age. So it's between 85 and 95 <coughs> years or between, or maybe a smaller bracket. Those are not identifiable, but it's because we've sort of, we've modified them to, to be sort of a bit loose and not to be identifiable. Yes? So does it take to get out uh -huh. You have to give away your firstborn. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I'm going to go over it a bit later after lunch. Uh, but basically, you have to fill out a form. You have to sort of say yeah, your main why you didn't get a review uh, ethical review board. You have to declare your computer infrastructure to see, make sure it's secure. And you have to state why you want to have a look at this data. And then that gets reviewed by a group of bioethicists, and they sort of grant you or don't grant you uh, access. And it's also, this document is also signed by somebody who can fire you. 
So that should you digress from any of the rules that you signed off on saying that you will never re-identify this, you will never share this, these files to anybody else who's not authorized to look at them, and so on and so forth, then that person, we can go say, that person violated the rules, you should fire this person. That's never happened yet. But technically, I think it's put the scare of, of whatever <laughs> into these people. And so we, they, so the whole discussion about people not abiding by these rules is, is a whole debate of a lot of bioethicists. Um, but, but basically, there's a form you have to fill out. You have to, it has to get, it, you get, it get signed by you. Basically, the same person that would sign off on your grants or, or sign off on large you know, for your institution, and then it gets sent to the to the uh, DACO office. They review it, and then they, they grant you access. And they give it to you for a year, and you have to renew. The renewal process is a lot easier, but you have to go through the renewal again every year. So it's a one-year permission. Is it mostly done at the institution level? It's usually done at the lab level. So our lab, so ideally, so historically, so uh, and, uh, NIH does it at the... The PI has to do it, and the PI has the login and the password, and then the PI gives the login and the password to everybody in his lab or her lab. And that's not, we thought that wasn't a very good idea, so what we did is we actually made it very easy for a PI to add and remove people from his or her lab to the list of people who has access to the data, so that each one of them has their own login and password, basically, to access this data. And if a PI, is, you have a summer student, you can add somebody for three months, and when they're gone, you take them off the list. And they don't have access anymore. So, yes. So right now, every project is doing it on my list. That that's a problem. It's a big problem. And so this is why um, uh, Andrew referred to the uh, GCGA pan-cancer analysis. And we're doing one right now for ICGC, where we're doing a, we're going to take 3,000 genomes, we're going to apply the same pipeline to all 3,000 genomes, and we're publishing this pipeline. And so we're making these pipelines publicly available. So YCR is in the process of making all of our pipelines available as well. But that's only for us, not for everybody. So everybody's going to be writing papers and they're going to reproduce their, you know, publish their pipelines as, as they see fit. But we're, our concept of publishing a pipeline is actually putting everything into a, a VM, a virtual machine, with all this. You can download and run, put your data into it, then run the, the tools. It has all the tools with all the parameters and everything that we use and make that available. And so we're going to do that for the ICGC pipeline that we're going to use for the pan cancer project. So then It's all they, they're, they're benchmarking, and I'm not going to report on the benchmarking results because they're not public yet, but it's not pretty. I can say that much. And if you get me a beer, maybe I can tell you a bit more. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't tell you more, but it's, it's not pretty. <laughs> So, um, uh, so I have, let's see, what do we have here? Uh, uh, uh. Oh, yeah, so I have uh, this file. This is a file I downloaded, actually, from uh, ICGC repository. It's on my computer, and now I can look at it, and I'm sort of asking you to do that. And, and see what you, you, you gleam out of that file. So I'll give you an example of once your file is on is in um, on your computer, and I'm sort of showing you which folder it is on my computer, but your computer would be a different folder, and um, and have a look at that file and, and, and see see what you have. So you can do that later uh, during the lab time. So I mentioned. Um, Data nomenclature and metadata, and it's critical for everybody to work with. And if we found mistakes, we should. I talked about that for with respect to GenBank, but.
but basically that's true for any database. And so every database will have an, an email address you can email to if you have problems, you can't find something or and so forth. And it's uh, going to make uh, more sense. Actually, this is uh, probably a good place for me to stop right now. So it's 25 after the hour. Uh, we have lunch until 1.30, so for an hour and five minutes. And uh, we'll get back and we'll finish uh, the second half of my lecture, see if I'm actually halfway through. Uh, not quite, but I can talk fast. Almost halfway. Actually, no, it is actually almost halfway. Yeah. yeah. So we're at page 37 out of 70 something. It's actually exactly halfway. Okay, so we're going to break for lunch until 1.30. And uh, as a reminder, there's uh, this building is connected to two other buildings on the ground 